Welcome to the Open Forum. Once again, we have the wonderful privilege and pleasure of looking together into this magnificent book, the Bible, and looking at this verse or that verse uh, that has been a difficult verse for us to understand, and maybe as we look at it together, we can know what God really is saying uh, as we compare Scripture with Scripture, we learn more and more how to understand difficult verses. Uh, but this is your program. We want to hear from you. So shall we take our first call tonight, please? Welcome Hi. to Open Forum. Hi, Brother Camping. How are you? Very well, thank you. Pleasure to be uh, on the show and ask you this question. Um, my question today is in John 8... Uh, 28. In John 8, yes, verse 28. John 8, verse 28. Then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. Now, what is your question? My question is, this, what is really Jesus saying when he says, then you will know when you raise the Son of Man, um, what? lift the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he. What does he really mean by that? Then you shall know that I am he. Well, you see, uh, Christ is the, is the Savior, and he made payment for the sins of all the elect, those that he planned to save before the foundation of the world. And that salvation plan is completely in place so that when Abel, uh, who was uh, the son of Adam and Eve, when he became saved, everything was in place. The blood had been shed because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. sins that had all come in place. And uh, when uh, Moses became saved... Uh, Everything was in place. And Abraham, when he became saved, and Peter, and anybody else. But when Christ came to demonstrate how he suffered when he was put on the cross, and first of all, he had already demonstrated that he is God, because remember, even at the wedding of Cana of Galilee, the very first, the very first, uh, a miracle that he did he demonstrated that he was the creator as he turned the finest wine or the water into the finest wine uh, and uh, uh, there he also demonstrated how he was the savior and and uh, again and again he had shown that he was god but when, but is he really the one who made the payment for our sins? Is he really? And when he was hanging on the cross and had become a curse, cursed is everyone who is put on a tree and that, that, or on the cross. And uh, he, uh, he became that curse as he, uh, as he, uh, uh, it was hanging there, uh, uh, and as well as the fact that they they stripped him of his clothing, and and actually he was a dismal curse, which is required by the Savior in making payment for our sins, because he had to become like we are. Uh, th that is, those who he planned to save are, are under the curse of God. And then when he died and was put in the tomb. That demonstrated further. He is the Christ. He is the one who had made payment for our sins. He's demonstrated this as he was cursed in the eyes of all those who see him. And then he's put in the tomb. And, uh, and then on Sunday morning he is resurrected to show that the payment has been... Uh, he's demonstrating that the payment had been fully paid but thank you um, yes oh sorry so when he says thank you um, then you shall know that I am he who is he that he's talking about then you shall know who is he well you see 
uh, that he is God, that he is he, that because the whole message of the Bible is salvation, is to somehow get relief from the horrible situation that prevailed when Adam and Eve rebelled against God and there they, they became the progenitors of the whole human race and so every human being is is under the wrath of God uh, and dead in his sins because of Adam's sin and so what is the whole human race looking for uh, how can we get right with God how can we and God declared all through the Bible that there is a Savior, that there is someone who would come and make provision. When, when they offered the burnt sacrifices, they were looking, they were remembering or being reminded that Christ had become a, a burnt offering for them. He had come under the wrath of God. But who is Christ? Where, where is he? And when he came uh, to demonstrate that he was, uh, that he is the Savior, and as we look at him, first of all, as he uh, demonstrates that he is the crea Creator, and, as the, and other things that he has demonstrated, then when we see him being cursed in the most terrible way, and then actually dying and being put in a grave and then rising again, then we know he is he. <laughs> that is, he is the Messiah. He is the Savior. He is the uh, great I am God himself who would come to make payment for our sins. Wow. Uh, that's incredible. Thank you so much, Billy Camping. Thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi. Um, I have a question. I was listening to um, the, end, the end time story, you know, uh, for May 21st, which is on a Friday. And that is that Friday is supposed to represent the, the Passover. Is that correct? May 21st is on a Friday, and so is October 21st there. Okay. Well, uh, my question is this. If it's on a Friday, are we supposed oh, to prepare me. like a Seder for that? I, I was, I'm not sure. I, I, I don't think October 21st is on a Friday uh, because, let's see, that's 153 days after. And uh, uh, let's see. If we divide 7 into 153, we get 2 and 1 over. So it looks like it would be on a Thursday when October 21 comes around in May 20 in uh, in 2011. Oh, so it's not on a Friday. But yeah. that is well, not. Well, my question was that if if the, uh, May 21st was on a Friday, if we would have if we should prepare a seder for that day. No, but but when not. Christ when Christ is coming to complete our salvation by rapturing all, catching up all the true believers, and by, uh, by uh, bringing the rest of the world into the first day of the day of judgment, that is not the Passover. The Passover was back on April 1 in 33 A.D., and okay. the May 21 is the date of the completion of what was, what was demonstrated at the Passover. At the Passover, Christ demonstrated in April 1 of 33 A.D. that he had made payment for our sins, that he, uh, uh, as he hung on a cross. And then on May 21, 2011, the last part of what is required to prepare the true believers to be with Christ forevermore in heaven takes place because we all receive our glorified spiritual bodies. Okay, thank you. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Oh, thank you, Brother Camping. Yeah. Um, uh, I just have two quick questions. Um, first of all, are you 
just for the record, where are you absolutely positive, no doubt at all about May 21, 2011? You're completely certain and that that is the... I can't be more positive. I cannot be more positive. I'm absolutely certain. And if you want to see a man that's got his neck out, it's me, because I've said this repeatedly and repeatedly, and uh, and yet, and I'm because I'm utterly convinced. In fact, I would be sinning, I would be t uh, rebelling against God if I simply said maybe or uh, that's a high probability and it might not happen. I don't dare talk that way. I must, absolutely must declare it is going to happen on that day. Okay, and my second question is, I, I believe you and I believe the Bible. I've been reading your books a long time. Um, the problem is, Harold, is that whenever I, nobody is listening to me, when I try to share with them this information, they tell me that I'm crazy and that um, I, I belong in a mental institution and um, nothing's going to happen. Nobody, I, well, just, no one's listening to me. <laughs> well, join the party. You know, we get callers on this program that uh, don't, don't believe it at all. Uh, and that's because they are not familiar with what the Bible is teaching. They are listening to their own minds, and they think that what their thoughts are giving them, uh, their understanding from their own brains, they think that they can figure something out, but they're really pitting their teeny, teeny little intelligence, which is all that any of us have, against the infinite intelligence of God. And, uh, and, uh, but that's the character of man. And so they scoff. In fact, remember in, remember in Second Peter chapter 3, uh, there, there it says, as it's talking about these days, it's saying, uh, knowing, in verse 3, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue to be as they were from the beginning of the creation. God God is full God prophesied this two thousand years ago that this is what they would be doing in this day. So we shouldn't be at the slightest bit surprised. Well, thank you, and God bless you, and we love you very much, Harold. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, uh, Matthew 12, verse 32. Matthew 12, verse 32. There we read... Uh, and whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world nor in the world to come. Now, what is your question? Okay. Um, Jesus, God, and the Holy Spirit, as I believe, is one. So how can one be more devastating than... Heaven forbid Jesus Christ or our Heavenly and Holy Father. Well, uh, this, this particular sin is, uh, is spelled out for us in the Gospel of Mark. The, uh, uh, this relates not to just uh, any kind of blasphemy. We can blaspheme God but, and, and uh, be forgiven if we, if we finally become a child of God. But, the, the scribes, the theologians of the church of Jesus' day, of the, of the nation of Israel, they believed with all their heart that Christ was under the power of Satan rather than under the power of God or under the power of uh, the Holy Spirit. And they, of course, the last thing they would ever want was to think about Christ as their Savior. They... They, they wanted nothing to do with him because in their honest judgment and 
they believed that he was of of uh, Satan, and God in that context says, if any if uh, if anyone has blasphemed the Holy Spirit, there is never any forgiveness, and that is this particular sin that this verse is addressing. And so I've never met anybody who has committed that sin, but there, perhaps there have been people. But there certainly were the scribes of Jesus' day, and they, they were in trouble at all by what Christ is saying here, because they thought he was, he was of Satan anyway. Thank you. Can I have one more question concerning Proverbs, the Book of Wisdom? Proverbs 17, verse 24, and then I'll be done. Thank you so much, Dr. Camping. Proverbs 27, 24, and forget the word doctor, because I'm, <laughs> I'm not a medical doctor, nor a theologi theological doctor, nor anything. I have a, I have a full-time uh, project just caring for me and my wife and trying to... I continue to be in health as long as possible by God's mercy. But, I okay. wish I could be just one percent of you, sir. I love you, but no disrespect. I would like to listen to Proverbs 17, verse 24, and I do love you. Wisdom is before him that hath understanding, but the eyes of a fool are in the ends of the earth. Now, what is that saying? This is parable language, of course. The parable? Uh, wisdom is before him that hath understanding. Now, to have understanding means that you are a child of God and ha got your spiritual eyes open to begin to understand the truths of the Bible. And therefore... You can be called wise, not because you're wise in yourself, but because God has given you the wisdom of, of understanding. But the eyes of a fool are in the ends of the earth. Uh, actually, you know, mankind really finds his hope, his, uh, his security, his everything, not in a God that they can't see and uh, that people are talking about, but in this earth itself. I, they, in fact, I, I remember when I was in grammar school, I went to public school, and I learned all about Mother Earth. Mother Earth. Not about God who created the earth, but Mother Earth. And, uh, that, uh, and so that's why today, for example, there's a lot of hysteria about uh, about uh, global warning, warming and such things, because Mother Earth, their God, their God is wearing out. It's not. It looks like it's going to die, and we've got to do something about it. It is. Their eyes are in the ends of the earth. They are looking at everything in the earth uh, uh, to find their hope and their desires and so on but not at all upon the God of the Bible. But well, that's... thank you, uh, Mr. Campaign. I, I, like I said, if I could be 1% of your wisdom, I would have something. And I truly love you, and I truly believe in what you're teaching. May we all be raptured today on that day. Well, Peace thank be you. with you, my friend. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hey, Brother Camping, I've got uh, two questions. Um, one is related to um, the rich man and Lazarus. Um, I understand what you talk about. If, a, if uh, an unsaved person, once they die, they cease to exist. But in the story of the rich man and Lazarus, how is it that if the rich man being unsaved, um, isn't he in a place of hell? Well, because that is a parable. That is not an actual happening. God in that parable is teaching us a number of spiritual truths. One oh, truth that is that what is happening in this world, uh, as we look at it, doesn't tell us what the what really is happening. The poor man, Lazarus, looked like he was scum. He looked like he was nothing. He looked like he was uh, 
uh, uh, uh, not even worth thinking about, and yet he was the one who was a child of God and ends up in the bosom of Abraham, which is a figure of speech to be under the perfect care and keeping of God forevermore. On the other hand, the rich man had everything going for him in this world, and he looked like he was a wonderful child of God, and he, uh, uh, he uh, by the language that he was clothed in purple and so on, and uh, and uh, yet he died, and then it says he was buried, uh, and then in hell. Now, uh, when you're buried, you're dead. But right there, God is as, as is speaking about him as if he's still alive, so that he can teach some more principles. And there we see that he is uh, his great punishment is that he sees. It. At, uh, Lazarus in the bosom of Abraham and he's in the grave whereas it should have been just the reverse in his mind and that was a horrible terrible torment to him and uh, and there were other principles there he uh, wanted to uh, he finally asked could could you send Lazarus with a drop of water uh, 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 to cool my tongue and that's like saying, oh, if, if only I could have just a little bit of the gospel, a little bit of the blessing of the gospel throughout eternity. But no, the answer comes, nope, nope. You've had your time in, uh, when you were alive, but now it's all over, all over. There's a great chasm. There's no way that the mercy of God can come to you any longer. And there are other principles that are offered in that parable. I see. My other unrelated question is, um, in regards to May 21 of 2011, um, seeing that, um, um, well, well, I lost my, my question. Oh, my question was that, um, do you think that um, when May 21 comes along, like every, tr every true believer has to believe that May 21, 2011 is is the day in order to be raptured, or there'll be people unaware of May 21, but yet still be raptured? I have no idea about those things, but I do know that if we, uh, if we hear about that, and then if we say, well, maybe it could happen, maybe it could happen, it, it kind of makes sense, are we really trusting the Bible? The answer is mm -hmm. no. We're listening to the Bible. We think, yeah, it's possible the Bible is true. But we're not really ready to agree that the Bible is the infinite Word of God and uh, infallible Word of God and, and is absolutely trustworthy. And so I'm afraid that those who are just saying, well, maybe, maybe it'll happen, it could happen, I'm afraid for them. I. I'm afraid that they're going to be going into the day of judgment because those who are true believers, that's the characteristic of a true believer, that they really trust the Bible implicitly because they know that was written by God. It came from the mouth of God. And, uh, and so uh, that's, that's what we're going to listen to. But All right, great. Yeah, yeah. I've I've read your work and I've checked it, double checked it, and triple checked it. And man, let me tell you, it is accurate. It doesn't get any more accurate than that. Well, thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, brother Campy. Yes. How are you doing tonight? Very well, thank you. Um, I got a question for you right now. Um, what language will we speak in heaven? I have no idea. We'll be speaking a uh, language that uh, that is that is the language of God, but what that is, I have no idea. As a matter of fact, we're going to flesh and blood does not inherit the kingdom of God. The Bible tells us it means that we will have spiritual bodies. What is a spiritual body? I haven't the slightest idea, uh, but it's going to be quite different and infinitely more glorious than our present body. So there's a lot of wonderful surprises that are going to come our way if we are raptured. 
But yeah, I was just wondering to know that because um, I've been getting many questions on it and stuff like that. And um, thanks for clearing that, buying that for me. Well, I'm, that's the best I can do to help you. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Well, yeah. Yes, go ahead with your call. Welcome to Open Forum. The number is 1-800-322-5385. 1-800-322-5385. Thank Good you. evening, Mr. Camping. How are you tonight? Very well, thank you. Glad to hear that. Mr. Camping, I called you two weeks ago and I asked you a oh, question. Oh, excuse but, me. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, but, excuse me. Uh, you know, we have a rule, and maybe you didn't know about no, it. No, but, but Mr. Camping, I we, know your rule. Wanted, I understand uh, well, it, okay. but you didn't answer Excuse my question. Me. Excuse me. You called two weeks ago. Please wait for two more weeks and then call and then ask your question all over again. But we can't, We if we begin to make exceptions, then the next one and then the next one. And there are so many people trying to get into this program. There are people who've been trying for six months to trying to get in, and we have to leave it, leave that little room open for them. I'm sorry. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes, go ahead with your call. Um, yeah, the, the last person or two people ago that called was questioning about the rich man and Lazarus. Yes. And you said that it was a parable? Yes. Well, how are you to distinguish which stories are parables and which ones are not? Well, we have to distinguish them by the way the story is written or where they, how the way the history is. We, we uh, first of all, we learn more and more about what the what the spiritual message of the Bible is and then we see that God God uh, declared that to us in various ways in parables for example now the fact that a man is in the grave and then he's speaking to somebody in heaven that automatically indicates it has to be a parable but there's equal stories that have just as awkward circumstances that I'm sorry, we have to, I'm sorry, we have to pause for a moment. I'll be right back with you. We're continuing with the Open Forum, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Oh, hey, hi, Mr. Camping? Yes, go ahead with your call. Yes, Mr. Camping, I was just curious to where, with all, due, with all due respect, where does the Bible suggest that we formulate a timeline uh, to predict uh, when Jesus will return. I just never came across that. I was just wondering if you can help me with that. Well, for, to begin with, you look in Ecclesiastes chapter 8. We find a surprising statement in a surprising place. Uh, uh, we find in Ecclesiastes 8 verse 5, Whoso keepeth the commandment shall feel no evil thing. That's We can understand that. Those who are uh, true believers, they want to do the will of God, and their sins have all been paid for. Then it goes on, and a wise man's heart, and in this context, the wise man is anyone who is a true believer, uh, uh, discerneth or will know both time and judgment, because to every purpose there is time and judgment. Therefore, the wickedness, not misery, but the wickedness of man is great upon him. Now, this is a very, very unusual statement, because here it is saying that somehow, sometime there's going to be a time when a true believer, because that is the heart of a wise man, will know time. And you know, the people all through the history of the world have tried to figure out the date of creation, the year of creation, and have absolutely been unable to do that until our day. Uh, they have tried to know uh, f uh, for sure when uh, Christ uh, was born, and they have absolutely no way of, uh, they were unable to find out exactly, although now we know it was October 
the uh, the twenty eighth, I, be I believe I I'm speaking from memory now uh, of the year uh, of the year seven B C, uh, and uh, and of course they have wanted to know when will Christ come again, and nobody until the end of the church age was able to determine that nobody, I don't care how serious they were, how diligent in their study, how desirous they were to know, how holy they were, how, uh, how, how faithful they were to the Word of God, they could not know. But once we get past the end of the church age, uh, as we understand the timeline uh, uh, as it's developed from the earlier years all the way progressively toward the end, we get to the point where we learn that uh, on the first day of the Great Tribulation, which began in on May 22, uh, May uh, 21 in, uh, in, in uh, 1988, that God opened the seals of a book that had been already written and put in the Bible over 2,000 years ago uh, to the prophet Daniel, and he had been told to, to seal it up, and it was to be open at the time of the end. And uh, now that it's been open, my, my, we found just information after information that the church had never, uh, and no theologians had ever known about, because that is God's plan, that now in this end we will know time and judgment. And these things we're learning all have to do with, with the judgment process of the end, have to do with the timing of the end, and indeed Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 5 and 6 have really come into a full, a full, a full evidence in our day. I really appreciate you spending uh, time explaining that to me. Thank you, Mr. Campin. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Mr. Campin. Thanks for taking my call. Yes. I had a couple of uh, statements to make and let you then comment on them. The uh, first is uh, the caller who called in about the parable of the rich man and Lazarus who uh, was suffering in the, the torments of uh, Hades. Uh, that parable or story, whatever it was, plus the other allusions that Jesus makes to the torment of the wicked, uh, he will be punished with an everlasting torment that will be punished with everlasting punishment. Uh, fire is one of the allusions he uses. One of the metaphors is, of course, a worm that never dies, a fire that's not quenched out of uh, darkness. Excuse it's, me. Ex yes, sir. Oh, yes, sir. Excuse me. I want to interrupt something. You know, that word torment used in Luke 16, one thing is, when we read the Bible, we uh, we don't just wave our arms and just kind of make generality a general, uh, uh, I, I bring our general ideas to bear on it. We have to search the Bible and compare Scripture with Scripture. And we've learned that every word in the original language was written uh, from the mouth of God. It is absolutely carefully designed. Everything in the Bible is very, very carefully designed. And we've learned that the Bible is its own dictionary. And that word torment, I'm tormented in this flame, and uh, it's used once more in that parable, uh, is only, it's a Greek word that's only found two other places. And in both other places, it absolutely is, is talking about being saddened because the, uh, someone is afraid that they'll never see a friend again or a family member again. And uh, so we have the definition. Uh, I am saddened in this flame. And now we search the Bible. Why does it use the word flame? Because we read in Hebrews chapter 13 that God is a consuming fire. And, uh, and so any judgment is under the heading of fire. But 
but when uh, but when you're saddened, you're not burning. You're you're just saddened, and yet that is the chief focus of the suffering of this rich man. He is utterly saddened, and we why was he saddened? Because he saw his uh, friend Lazarus, who he was not really his friend. It was just that that poor that poor wretch that was out there and is by the gutter of his of his palatial house uh, where he was uh, the dogs licked his sores and where he ate out of the garbage pail and uh, but he didn't realize that this Lazarus was a child of God and now he sees him in the glory of God forevermore while it, uh, while he is in the grave where well, he is he it, it, which means that he is never going to uh, receive that that wonderful glory of being forever with the Lord Jesus Christ in the new heaven and the new earth and this was a blow of a serious proportion to him this is what he was counting on he was a great man in this life and he's going to be a lot greater when he's going to rule over the other nations or other whatever God wants him to rule over and he's going to be co-heirs with Christ of the new heaven and the new earth and now he finds not he won't have any of that at all and it was a fantastic a blow to him so that he's saying I'm tormented in this flame that is and that is going to be incidentally the chief the chief concern, the chief anguish, the chief unhappiness of the, of the church people who will go into the day of judgment. They're going to see others that they uh, thought couldn't possibly be. A, they were never part of the church or anything. And they're seeing them being raptured uh, and they themselves are left behind. And the Bible tells us they too will be angry, angry, angry. They will be weeping and gnashing their teeth. That's a figure of, of yelling and screaming at God. And they won't cease until they're dead because they, because they will die during that day of judgment. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Harold. Yeah. Yeah, uh, the, the, why they're confused is that word is sorrowing instead of saddening. It's sorrowing, you keep saying. Sorrowing? Yeah, that's, instead of sad, saddening, it's sorrowing. When you look it up in the Oh, sad, or we are saddened. Yeah, but. Oh, oh the word is sorrowing. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. I. I, I I do confuse that. Yeah, I know. Is, I hear it all the time. But it, it, it anyway, is the word sorrowing, but that is very close to saddening. Yeah, I understand. But I heard a guy call you the other day, and he was he he didn't he he was looking up the word saddening, I think, and he he was uh, uh, he he got confused when. Uh, oh, I'm so grateful that you called. You know, if I didn't have your kind of people to <laughs> keep me straight, where do you think I'd be going? <laughs> Could you look up uh, uh, Acts five fifteen, please? Acts 5, verse 15, there we read, Inasmuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. You know, you know, I used to hear that people used to say that his shadow was healing people. What is, what is this verse saying? Is that it doesn't say that at all, does right. it? Right. No, it doesn't. But no, I've it heard that. So that's that's a a, a, a fallacy, yeah. right? Yeah. In other words, the people were so became so trusting in Peter that they were hoping that even the shadow of Peter. But it doesn't say that that healed anybody. Right. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Sammy. Thank Sammy. you for emphasizing that, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, Mr. Camping. Yes. Um, I'd like you to read uh, John 6, 37 through 40, and then I'd like uh, to ask you... John please. chapter 6, verse 37 to 
40. There we read, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth him may have everlasting life, uh, or might have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Now, what is your question? Or what is, yes, what is your question? My question is that conceivably we are listening to the expositions of a man who conceivably is not saved and won't be saved when Christ comes. So how do you resolve that, that we, are, we may be listening to the expositions of a, of a lost man? A man who is not saved. We may be listening to the exposition you, of... Of a man who is lost in the final day. Unless you have assurance that you will be saved. Well, this, this, this is simply discussing what salvation is. I came but down... That is my question to you. We, we possibly could be listening to a man who is a lost man. Uh, who's the, uh, what man are you talking you. about? I'm talking about you, unless you have assurance that you're saved. Oh, well, the problem is, is what I am teaching is not a function of whether I am saved or not. It's a function of whether it is being faithful to the Word of God. People ask me from time to time, am I saved? And I have so to answer words, that. So in other words, we could be listening me, to the exposition. Excuse me, that is not the issue. The issue is... Is the Bible, are we faithfully teaching what the Bible teaches? That is the focal point, the proof, uh, the uh, everything that is worth anything is the Bible itself. Not what comes out of my mouth, but what does the Bible I, say? I believe it's all tied together, Mr. Camping. I believe it's all tied together. Uh, would, what do you have to say about verses... Uh, 36 through 37 through 40. Sounds to me like we're all predestined to be saved. It's a matter of choice. Well, it may, that may, excuse me, believing. That, that may be your conclusion, but when we go through the whole Bible, like for example, the Bible says, No man cometh to me except the Father draw him. It looks and, to me excuse like. Excuse me, and the whole, and we find that that uh, uh, the vast majority of all the people will end up under the wrath of God, not under the blessing of God. And, uh, and uh, we find that, uh, that uh, nobody, the Bible, like, 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 let me just read, for example. There, there's a preponderance of evidence, though, that we, all we need to come to Jesus and believe and follow him. Now, you're right. The majority of people won't be saved in the end because they'll reject the Lord. Well, excuse me. But we me. can be assured that we have salvation if we believe and accept and have faith and uh, follow him. That is the gospel that you have been taught, and that's taught in church after church after church. And uh, But now let's see what's the Bible, what the Bible says. The Bible says faith is work. Now, faith is a noun. Believing is a verb for the word faith. And the Bible clearly says the work of faith. And then it says in Galatians chapter 1. Now, the, I'm, I'm quoting from what from God has said, not what I have said. What, what I have said is not important. What has God said? He said in verse 16 of Galatians chapter 1, uh, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. Now, believing is a work of the law. Faith is work. And so God is insisting here 
that no man is justified. To become justified means to become saved by the faith, uh, by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, because Christ did the work. Faith is work. He did the work of saving us, and that is why we're saved, not because we did any work. And it goes on. Not, uh, not by works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. And so you can, you can uh, believe, you can argue, you can jump up and down and say, oh, but I believed and therefore I find verses that say that I uh, uh, should therefore be saved. But the fact is, no. If you're trusting in your the fact that you have believed, you're trusting in work that you have done. And there are other passages that the Bible teaches that if you are trusting in any work of your own, you are absolutely not saved at all. And that's the horrible, horrible situation in every church today. They ha are teaching a gospel that is leading men to uh, the judgment day. They, they, are, they do not understand that, that we cannot trust in anything that we have done. They, 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 you have been taught to trust in your water baptism, in your confession of faith, in uh, all of these things all help and get and your church membership and becoming saved. And all of this is contrary to what we read right here in Galatians chapter 1. But thank you for calling and sharing. And this is, but you know, the wonder of this all is that we're still one year away from Judgment Day. And Nineveh, in the days of Jonah, was 40 days away from, from being destroyed. And yet they cried out to God and they sat in sackcloth and ashes and they plead, pleaded with God, is it possible that you might change your mind? And they did at that late time with such a tiny little knowledge of what the Bible is teaching did become saved. We have that information given to us in the Bible. Now, here we have a year and if I were if you thought I was still unsaved, I would be praying every time again and again and again. Uh, oh, Lord, have mercy. Is it possible? Is it possible that I might become a child of God before it's too late? Oh, Lord, I know I don't deserve it, but and I don't know whether you plan, uh, your plans included this for me, but, oh, could it be? Is it possible? And, and I would just keep pleading with God and pleading with God uh, right up until the end. But thank you. And there is a great multitude. There are a, uh, it's a large crowd of people that are being saved in this day. The Bible absolutely assures us of that. We know that beyond a shadow of a doubt. And, uh, and my, that, that is wonderful that it, that amongst those who are crying out for God's mercy, there will be uh, a number of them that are becoming saved at, right at this last time. That is the glorious news that we can set, shout forth uh, at this time in the history of the world, along with the dismaying news that the end is only a year away. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, Harold. Yes. Uh, the last caller that seemed to be disillusioned by the fact that he thought everyone would be saved, you could have answered his question with the verse that he gave. Uh, the verse 37 of John 6, all that the Father giveth. He didn't give Christ all the names, just the ones he chose. Yeah, well, well the, the, uh, uh, the verse he gave you, you could answer them. Well, yes, but he, you know, he wasn't saying that everyone would become saved. He was saying that what the churches teach—that it's up to you. You can become saved potentially, 
anybody can become saved. He was not saying that everybody would become saved. But thank well, I, you for your input. I believe that was the impression he had, but anyway. Thank thanks. you. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Brother Camping? Yes. Uh, uh, an earlier caller talked about uh, what day of the week the last on May 21st would land. Yes. And it lands on uh, Saturday. Or it and, lands on uh, Saturday. You mean? Oh, I, I oh. checked the calendar. I got a calendar to check off each day. And October 21st is on a Friday. October 21st is a. Oh. Well, I, but May 21st, you know, today is the 7th. Today is the 7th. And, uh, well, I, uh, okay. I'm talking I, about 2011. I, yeah, yeah, I misunderstood. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're right. Mm -hmm. So I think you're correct. It lands on Saturday and mm -hmm. May 21 uh, and October 21 on Friday. Correct. Yeah, I, uh, that's the end of the week. Saturday is the end of the week. And it's the end, it's again the fulfillment of a, of a period of seven, seven, uh, uh, the last, the Saturday is the seventh day. It's seven thousand years after the flood, and so on. Okay, but, and thank you for your wonderful work. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, good uh, evening, uh, brothers um, camping. The gentleman that called that was so sure about uh, everyone was going to be saved. How about Ephesians chapter two, verse eight? Oh well, uh, yes, there are a host of verses that could yeah. be offered, but that's a but beautiful it, verse. It Ephesians is. two, for by grace are ye saved through faith. And, and not of yourselves, of, yeah. it is the gift of God. Yeah. It is not of yourselves, it is the gift of good, God. And thank you for sharing that. You bet. Thank you for your time and bless you. And shall we take our next call? Please welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Hello? Yes, welcome. Yeah, so I want to know what is going to happen to sincere people that are Catholic, Christian, Jehovah's Witness, Mormon? And that do believe in Christ. Well, all those in the churches, because they are trusting in their church or their doctrines of their church, and they're not trusting in the whole Bible. And that really is what the true gospel is, to really believe that every word in the whole Bible is the word of God, and, and I trust it implicitly. And if we're there... There are all kinds of chapters in the Bible that they know nothing about. They don't want to know about it. They are satisfied with trusting their church. And the Bible emphasizes they will be entering the day of judgment. It will be a, the most terrible, terrible, terrible day for all the churches that anyone could ever imagine. Uh, and that's why we're hoping that at least... A few people from the churches will have their eyes open before it's too late and and recognize that they have to listen more carefully to the whole Bible. But thank you for calling in, Sherry. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome, Debbie. Yes. Uh, my, my question to you is, why are you teaching something that is totally contradicting to the Bible? You, the Bible says that no man knows the time, neither the date when Jesus is going to come, and you already have a day set up for it. Why? Why are you teaching that for? Well, because the Bible declares that. You see, uh, for uh, for almost two thousand years, uh, God was very careful, and He talks a lot about that. No man can know the day or the hour. Christ is coming as a thief in the night. And uh, that is because as long as God was recognizing the church as, a, as a, a place where people might hear the gospel and become saved, uh, they, uh, 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 they were not to know anything about the timing of the end. But, but now that we're past that church age and we're right near the end, God also decreed that we would know 
the time. And he warns that those who are are remaining in the ch- in the churches and, and believing that Christ is coming as a thief in the night are heading for sudden destruction. Please read First Thessalonians five, the first six verses. First Thessalonians five. It's a scary passage for those who are believing that Christ is coming as a thief in the night. You are the one teaching that, but that's not going to happen. I wonder what are you going to say when 21st comes and nothing will happen. I wonder what are you going to say after that. Uh, you may say what you want, but I just want to listen to the Bible. We're continuing with our open forum program, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Camping. Could you please go to Deuteronomy? Chapter 30, and read verses 15 and 16, and then drop down to 19 through 20. All right, let's look at that. Deuteronomy 30, verses 15 and 16. C, I have set before thee this day life and good and death and evil, and then I command thee this day to love Jehovah thy God, so walk in his ways. And to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments that that thus thou mayest live and multiply. And Jehovah thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it. Moses is speaking uh, by, as God has given him the words to say, to the nation of Israel. And then in verse 19, I call heaven and earth to... were to record this day against thee, against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live, and that thou mayest love the Lord uh, Jehovah thy God, and that thou mayest obey his voice, and that thou mayest cleave unto him, for he is thy life and the length of thy days that thou mayest dwell in the land which Jehovah swore unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, and to give them. Now, what you know, is the, your question? The man, well, my question is, and comment, and I have another scripture, if you don't mind. The man that called before that everyone jumped on and he, when he said that uh, God has put this before us, a choice whether we want to serve him or not, or whether we want to live or not, this scripture says that that God, Jehovah, has put that choice before us. Now, whether we want to live is up to ourselves or if we want to die. A predestination is not a teaching of the Bible. Otherwise, we might as well just take a gun and blow our heads off if we, we don't even stand no, no, a chance no, no. anyway. Uh, excuse me. Why did you say the word predestination? That, that predestination is, word... is well, not excuse a me. Bible. A- excuse me. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, uh, uh, in verse 4. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made uh, us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, and so on. And so uh, you, you, uh, you, you are saying predestination doesn't make any sense. Well, you better read the Bible. You can't trust your thinking. You can't trust what somebody is telling you. You have to check it out in the Bible. And God very clearly has predestinated us. Now, when he comes to us to choose, he comes to us uh, that we have to believe. He comes to us that we have to repent. He comes to us that we have to uh, have to uh, be baptized. These are all commands that God gives us. And but we, the biblical rule is, we are to read the. We check every conclusion against the whole Bible and to make sure we've included everything. And then we find out that 
Sure, God commands us to do all those things, but we can't do it. We, but, but if we're not listening to the whole Bible, we say, okay, God commands me to repent. God ca- commands me to get baptized. God commands me to, do, to believe. Well, I'll do those things. And now I must have become saved. Well, you see, God held, gave that command to test us. Are you reading the whole Bible? And that is, a, that is a, an absolute requirement if we're going to come to truth. And then we would read uh, that we, we, we have to check those, our first conclusion that we, are, that we can repent, that we can be baptized, that we can, uh, we can ex- uh, choose or, or we can do this or that. And then we find, no, we can't because we're spiritually dead. And, and only if the Father draws him, we will come to him. And, uh, and uh, we have to be we're one of those who are predestinated. And how do I know whether I'm predestinated? I can pray, uh, uh, oh God, could it be? Is it possible that I too might become a child of God? And so we, only when we read the whole Bible will we know more precisely what God is teaching. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Welcome to Open Forum. The number is 1-800-322-5385. 1-800-322-5385. And shall we take our next call, please? Hi, Mr. Campion. How are you? Very well, thank you. Yes, I just called you to, uh, you want to read uh, Deuteronomy uh, uh, chapter 32, verse 39. Uh, This is for the first call of the call. Deuteronomy chapter 22. 22, 32. Verse 39. Uh, 22, verse 39. Or 32. Deuteronomy 32, verse 39. Well, let's see what that is. Uh, there we read. There we read. Uh, uh, see now I, even I, am he, and there is no God with me. I kill, I make alive, I wound, I heal. There is there any that can deliver out of my hand. Uh, uh, and uh, the fact is, uh, no, God is you, absolutely the sovereign ruler, and nobody can do anything without his good pleasure. Yeah, this was the first caller that wanted to find out why Christ said, so you know that I am E, and when I, you know, when you lift me up, you know that I am E. This is to say that Christ, e, Christ is eternal God, and, you know, I mean... You know, you got to read the Bible to find out that when he said, that I am he, this is what he's talking about, that he's eternal God. And Thank nobody. you. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, yes. Um, I'd like to, uh, I have a, let me turn down my radio just a second here. I have difficulties. Because I'm in a lot of pain and on pills, and my eyesight is fading. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Speak up a little bit more. Come a little closer, because we're not able to get your hear your question. Okay. Uh, my question is in Daniel 12:11. Uh, Daniel 12. Let me turn to that. Daniel 12, verse 11. There we read. Daniel 12. Verse 11, and from the time that the daily shall be taken away and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Now, what is your question? One, exactly what that's pertaining to, and two, most importantly to me, even more important than my first question, are what is exactly... Uh, I'm looking at the, what is the disgusting thing that is causing desolation? What is it? 
And where else in the Bible can one research? It's difficult for me to research anymore because I can't see. Oh, well, I, I slowly on go through the book of Jeremiah. Just, right, it's a big book. It's got long chapters. But you just read and read and read. That came right from the mouth of God. And it's talking about Israel, about Judah, about Zion, about Jerusalem. And actually, it is, uh, a, 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 when we understand it, finally, it is talking about the, all those who were, uh, all the churches also, and uh, that would come into existence. And there you read about sin after sin. Read the book of Lamentations that follows right after Jeremiah, where God is using the churches and national Israel as like they are speaking and, and they are lamenting the wrath of God and God is uh, through them, through that lament is discussing what, how they have rebelled against God. There's an enormous amount of information so that, that is directed word. at the wickedness of those who, uh, who uh, should have known better. In other words, is it correct for me to assume that disgusting and desolation could be of many different things at different times? Well, no, it's not of different times. It's of two times particularly. One is the, the, uh, uh, there, there were two major programs that the Bible has a lot to say about. One is the 1480 day, uh, 80 year period. It's an inclusive period, period, uh, when God looked upon the nation of Israel as the external representation of the kingdom of God. And that began in the year 1447 B.C., which uh, when they left Egypt to, to go uh, to the land of Canaan and possess that. And the other big piece of, of, of organization is that which is, began in 33 A.D. when 3,000 are saved, uh, when the Holy Spirit was poured out, and that marked the beginning of the church age when God would be sending the gospel for the next 1955 years all over the world, uh, and, uh, and there would be millions of churches uh, founded uh, in, uh, in every country. There would be churches uh, so that today about two-thirds of the world's population have some relationship with a church that claims Christ as their savior and these two major periods are what is in view in the language of judgment and jeremiah and uh, especially although when you read jeremiah 25 it also uh, makes a, a, a point also of of other nations that are outside of the nation of israel and outside of the church age but uh, but most of the time it is dealing with the with the, these two major periods of time uh, because they are the ones who had the Bible. They are the ones who right. should have been closest to God, and yet uh, God is just emphasizing how horribly rebellious they were against God. And just a, what's that quick reference on that same scripture for the uh, one uh, uh, the one thousand two hundred ninety days? Yeah, no, that is related. That is definitely related. First of all, God frequently uses a day as a year, and uh, and therefore we are uh, are able to know that we can look at this when we search the Bible for. Anything that happened 1,290 days apart, we cannot find anything at all. But when we start searching the Bible, uh, utilizing a day for a year, uh, which God does allow, then we have 1,290 years uh, between events. Then 
it, it fits in very perfectly. Uh, because in the year 1877, uh, Jacob and his whole family, that was uh, the beginning of the nation of Israel, uh, although it was uh, way, way early, 430 years before the official beginning. But nevertheless, that's where the nation of Israel came from. And they came into Egypt at the command of God to escape a famine, a huge famine in the land. And uh, that typified what the Bible later on speaks as a time of great tribulation. It was a famine of seven years duration. And then 1290 years later, in the year 587 B.C., Israel had become a nation for a long time, and they were under the wrath of God because of their, of all the rebellious things they had been doing. And so even as God uh, brought Jacob into the land of Egypt, out uh, away from the promised land of, e of Israel, so... God drove out all of the Israelites uh, out of the nation of Israel, of the land of Israel, into the land of Babylon and destroyed the temple, destroyed the walls of Jerusalem. And, uh, and it was, uh, it was uh, the same idea as in uh, the case of Jacob in 587, except now multiplied many times. And then exactly uh, uh, two times 1,290 years later, in the year 1994, we're right in the heart of the time when God's wrath is on both on national Israel and on the churches. Uh, uh, f uh, finally, uh, a, a God calls this a period of great tribulation. Uh, in Jacob's case, it was seven years duration. In uh, Israel's case, in 587, it was 70 years in duration. And in this time of great tribulation, it is 8,400 days, which is seven times 12 times 100. Again, the number seven is absolutely featured, and it ends up to be exactly uh, 23 full years and and we still have one year to go and then comes the day of judgment and all of this is anticipated in Daniel chapter 12 verse 11 where it talks about the the uh, uh, the the, the uh, abomination of desolation and that is yeah, talking about Satan one, ruling in the churches yeah, that's the other one I was wondering about, desolation and abomination. Uh, that was uh, what else was on the mind. You cleared that up very well for me. It might have assumed that in all the Bible that days uh, mean hundreds. Well, uh, no, you're not to assume that at all. You have to look at the context and what the Bible will allow. Uh, nor, like, for example, God talks about Israel being in the wilderness for 40 years. And uh, then, uh, uh, but that came as a result of the fact that they uh, made the golden calf when Israel, or, uh, well, first of all, uh, that was part of it, that they, uh, uh, they rebelled against God when Moses was uh, uh, up in the mountain for 40 days. But then, when they sent out the spies uh, two years later to spy out the land and they came back with a negative report and they did not want to go into the land, then God says, okay, then you're going to spend 40 years in uh, the wilderness, one day, one year for each day that the spies had been gone uh, in their searching out the land of Canaan. And so God gave additional information, but he did indicate that a day can be looked at, and if we can't find any other answer, a day can be looked upon as a year. Uh, and there is no other answer of 1,200 days anywhere in the Bible. You can search and search and search, and it just cannot be found. And yet, 
it is 1,200 days, and so it must be 1,200 years. That would be the proper conclusion we could come to. But thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, good evening. Uh, turn your radio off, please. Mr. Campton? Yes. Yes, um, good evening, sir. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Um, you say that in 4990, uh, that was the first coming, right? Isn't that 4990 correct? 4990 was the year of the flood, yes. Yes, okay. Now, um, you say in May 21, um, 2011, there will be a second coming. Well, no. The, uh, Christ did not come at the time of the flood. There's no record of that. He simply brought his judgment. The Bible doesn't emphasize that Christ came. Uh, Christ, uh, uh, when, he, when he went to the cross, it's the second coming in the sense that he, uh, 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 first of all, made payment for our sins before the foundation of the world. And now he has come uh, uh, to demonstrate, uh, uh, well, as a matter of fact, I don't think he calls the coming of Christ uh, uh, to go to the cross as a second coming. His second coming actually is at the time when uh, when he comes to rapture us, to, to complete our salvation, as well as to institute the day of judgment. I believe that is called the second coming. Oh, okay, so now, okay. So how would you know that there, there won't be a third coming? Well, because everything is wrapped up when we, when the, when we, we, as we see what happens uh, when the rapture occurs and when the day of judgment comes, there's nothing more the Bible talks about. There's nothing that comes after that. We have to find the, uh, we have to listen to the Bible for information. And if there's no information, then we can't talk about something. Okay, th thank you, Mr. Campton. Appreciate it. God thank bless you, you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, hello. Could yes. you read Ephesians chapter 2, verse 16? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 16. There we read. Uh, that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Yes. Now, what is um, your question? My question is, what do they mean by the cross if... That's a Christ very, very good question. A very good question. We read in Galatians chapter 4, where we read... Uh, in verse 13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for, it, for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Now, God uses the word tree or cross interchangeably. It's talking about the same thing. Uh, and yet here he is emphasizing that the p problem of sin is that we came under the curse of God. And Christ had to become a curse in order to make payment for our sins. And here we see him demonstrating that he had become a curse because he's being he's nailed to a cross or to a tree. And so when we see the word cross or tree in this kind of a context, we know that it is speaking about curse. And that's why in the passage that you are reading, now let me see, what was that verse? In, uh, 16. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, Ephesians 2.16. Ephesians 2.16. Yeah, Ephesians 2.16. We read there... Uh, uh, and that he might re reconcile both unto God in one body 
by the curse. That is, by the curse, not, not by the cross. Well, it's, uh, the cross signifies a curse by becoming a curse, having slain the enmity thereby. And, uh, and that is the, the uh, meaning of the word cross. Whenever we see the word cross, we, think immediate, we should think immediately that is where Christ was cursed. And he, when he came to demonstrate how he had made payment for our sins before the foundation of the world, he had to demonstrate that he, before the foundation of the world, before that he had God had ever created anything, God had made him a curse so that he would, uh, uh, as he was making payment for the sins of all those that he planned to save, they were under the curse, and now God took that, Christ took that curse upon himself. And then he demonstrated that he had become a curse so that when he came in 33 A.D. to be hung on a cross and die there, that there he demonstrated, you see, I became a curse. And, and then I died because the wages of sin is death. And in that way, I made payment. Uh, that, that shows how I made payment before I ever created the world. Um, I know in Revelation thirteen eight it says that, that that's a, a key verse for understanding from the foundation of the world. Yes. Um, Christ's suffering. Couldn't that be um, referring to the names written in the book rather than the lamb slain? That the names were written in the book rather than the lamb was slain from before the foundation? Well, uh, what, what is that? Well, I, I, I still didn't get your question. Um, where it says that, that from the foundation of yes. the world, and we say, okay, we understand from that verse that Christ was slain before the foundation of the world. But I'm saying, couldn't that sentence be referring to the names written in the book of life? Oh, well, we, that also happened, that we, our name, you know, God, uh, before he ever created the world, he did, he did all the preparation and all the work required to provide salvation. First of all, he had to have before him the names of the billions of people that would eventually become born. Then he had to select the names that he planned to save uh, the people that he planned to save and he wrote them in the Lamb's Book of Life and then he uh, took their sins he, because he knows the end from the beginning and they were laid on him but with that I have to say good night because we've come to the end of our time good night <laughs> 